Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today for this very special event. This is our very first collaboration with the Irish Network Portland and the Irish Network DC. One of the you know, silver linings of this experience over the last few years is that we can do events with the chapters all across the country virtually. So we're absolutely delighted to get to do this with our colleagues in Portland. Today, we're joined by Liz McGuire for bringing history out of the attic. Um, with Flea Market Love Letters, we're so excited to do this. Let's get started. So my name is Eva Delarge. I'm on the Irish Network Board uh, and Liz McGuire. You can introduce yourself in a second. Liz uh, used to be on our board and now lives in DC, or excuse me, in Dublin, but she used to live in DC with us. And this is where she started Flea Market Love Letters. So Liz, what are we gonna talk about today? Well, uh, thank you and thank you to everyone who's tuning in today. I know we're in different time zones. Um, uh, I'm in Dublin and it is a, a nice and cozy 9 p.m. So uh, I've had a nice cup of coffee and I'm ready to talk very quickly. So I'll try and slow myself down. Um, but tonight we're gonna talk about Free Market Love Letters, which is my digital archive of vintage love letters. We'll look at three different letters from the archive from three different periods of history. And then we'll talk a little bit about my fundraiser, which is the Write More Letters Project. And I am so appreciative and thankful to INDC and IN Portland for having me uh, along this evening. I love to talk about mail and I love to talk about other people's mail, especially. Ah, uh, all right. So Liz. How did Flea Market Love Letters get started? What is it? What is, a, you know, a, an archive of, of vintage letters? Tell us about it. So I started Flea Market Love Letters in 2017. Um, it is a, an archive of over 400 vintage letters, uh, which I'll sometimes call series or collections. A series or collection in kind of my vocabulary would be a start to a finish number of letters. So you could have letters starting in 1940 and ending in 1946. That would be a complete series or complete, complete collection. So with Flea Market starting in 2017, we have over 400 letters shared so far from about 20, 25 letter series. Um, and we've traveled, you know, from World War II to Queen Elizabeth's coronation to the 1930s to the 1910s to World War I, um, all through firsthand letters acquired from flea markets and auctions. So I started the project by sitting in my apartment and just photographing envelopes and putting them to Instagram. And here we are now uh, with kind of every day being a different adventure of opening a letter and seeing what's in there. That's so amazing, Liz. 400, that's that's a lot. How does it work? Like, how, what do you do the first time you get a letter? Just walk us through what happens. Sure. So um, I will use uh, an example of kind of how we get a letter to the collection. So if I'm not directly purchasing the letters, um, they're oftentimes donated. Aoife herself has very generously donated a series of letters that I'll actually be talking about later today. But I'll use Aoife's letters as an example. So um, in those letters, they kind of came all in their bundle. And when I got home, I put them into chronological order. Um, a dining room table is great for this. You need a big open space. Um, so I put them into chronological order and then I did what I usually do, which is I put them into binders. Um, and when the time came to be ready to photograph them, I sort of clear the space. I set up my camera, the whole deal, my phone, the whole thing and photograph every letter and every envelope together and apart and in different combinations. And then I get to typing. So I start typing the letters um, just in a Google Doc. And it's Saturday mornings, Friday afternoons, Wednesday evenings. It's before work, after work, lunch breaks. It's whenever I can get time to do them. Um, and once I'm done with sort of transcribing a letter, I will post it to the website and to the Instagram. So a common question that I started getting um, and which I have like a tangible answer for now is the kind of time commitment of it. Um, the first letter series that we shared this year was a World War II series called the Randano Letters. And that was 133 letters, handwritten letters, which was 144 typed pages, which totaled 57,000 typed words. <laughs> wow. So I basically written a book of other people's letters. <laughs> so what happens when you're typing and you come to a handwritten word that you cannot decipher? Like you obviously that, happens and how long does it take you to or do you park and say I have to go back to this word like what do you do 
So the handwriting um, is kind of something that you have to warm up to when you start with the series. You have to kind of read the first letter, slowly get into it. Um, but when there's a word that I can't read, I usually just put in brackets unreadable um, because I've found that over the years, that's kind of the easiest way to rapidly get through a letter if I can't read entire sections. But in the last year or so, there's been a lot of kind of more active interest in the project, especially on social media. So most times if I share a post on Instagram and you know, I'll say, I'll put the transcription of the letter in the caption and if I include unreadable, um, I've gotten emails before, I've gotten direct messages of people being like, I think the name is Tom. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so- That's amazing. Uh, yeah. People it's, are trying it's, to help. Oh, it's it's becoming, it is, it is always going to be and has always been a community project. But uh, it's just great because people really, they get very invested in these. And I should say, these are real stories. Um, so I've dealt with very intense subject matter in four years of doing this. And they're all real firsthand accounts from real people, yourself and myself. Um, and I don't always have to agree or think that I would be friends with the people whose letters I have. Um, but I do treat them as historical records. So there have been a few times kind of where people do want to help. And then there are other times where, you know, I've had to step into the comments on something and remind people that these are real people. So maybe if, maybe we should refrain from our theories about their love triangle and just enjoy. <laughs> oh my gosh, you anticipated the question I had, which was, are the comments crazy? Are people oh, crazy yeah. in the comments? Oh yeah. Yeah, I, I'm doing a series right now um, that I just started from 1912. And the guy is, let's just say, very ardently in love with someone who's maybe not replying as quickly as they should. Mm. And um, I'm familiar with the phenomenon. <laughs> <laughs> it's ghosting. She's ghosting him. Um, and I think in 2021, it's very like, we're very much like, calm down, George. But in 1912, it would have been very normal for a letter of, I have an aching headache. You're not replying to my letters. Are you alive? <laughs> in 20 Oh, no. Why is she muted? Oh, Liz, you've been muted. One second. That's, that's them. This, this is what <laughs> I'm saying. This is why you have to talk about the letters with respect. You can't see because this is a photograph, but I have about a thousand of them in binders on the shelf behind me. And I seriously come in here every morning. And I'm like, good morning. Please don't oh. watch. <laughs> so what you're saying is ghosting has been around for many, many. Many, many. It's got a new term for it. Oh yeah. And there's the first series of letters I ever did was the definition of ghosting. It was a war bride. Um, and she was writing to her American GI fiance who had gone back to New Jersey. And it was like end of 45, 46 in England. And um, in the entire series, and I think that's 10 letters, she just is basically going like, hey, babe, had a great day at work. Did you get the paperwork I sent? Because I can't, I can't get on the boat until you sign it. <laughs> and then oh, like wow. the, the, next, the next letter is her being like, so I missed that boat. Um, but there is another <laughs> one in eight weeks. So I, I've, sent the, I've sent the papers. Uh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> they end up well, getting okay. married. Let's, so get okay. into, let's get into some of these collections. I'm really excited to hear some of these stories now. <laughs> so what are, who, what are we going to start with, Liz? So we are starting with World War I. These are the green letters. So these are brothers Rex and Alfred who are writing to their mom in New Mexico while they are um, enlisted in the military. Um, the brothers enlisted towards the end of the war, so they aren't really seeing much active service until kind of right around Armistice Day, so right around this time of year, um, but they talk a lot about kind of um, training camp experiences and things like that. So the two examples that I pulled from the archive are one that mentions something we're all very familiar with, uh, which would be the, a, a mysterious flu going around. Um, <laughs> and the second one is uh, referencing Armistice Day. So that first letter up at the top, uh, just kind of, it's one of the only two references I was able to find. I was actually transcribing these in March of 2020. So that was very intense to be doing. Um, but basically he's talking about a bad flu that's certainly going around. 
um, and anybody who you know knows anything about history knows 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 what's what's going on there. So uh, the green letters. Hey, Liz, are do you see? Yeah. I, I, it took me a really long time to realize that that word was certainly. Um, do you see like some misspellings coming up a lot, like the same ones? Yeah, yeah. So that's a great question. Um, the different writers or author letter writers have different kind of like ticks, basically you could consider them their same, you know, everybody does. The words that the autocorrect knows that you need to, it fixes for you. Um, but certainly is one of these, um, I've had other ones, kind of an interesting grammar thing is that there weren't actually contractions used very often. So up until maybe the sixties or the seventies more. So uh, there's not a lot of can'ts and won'ts. It's a lot of will nots and cannots. So there's where there are apostrophes, they aren't really used. Um, and I worked with a handwriting specialist at the beginning of the year for a blog post. And she actually had a really great point that one of the reasons that's all kind of tying together is that um, when people were in the 19th century learning handwriting, they were learning from templates. So it's all very similar. Um, whereas mm -hmm. now when you pick up a pen, Aoife would have different handwriting than Roisin and I would have different than both of them. Um, whereas, you know, Alfred and Rex being brothers and having learned the same would have had very similar handwriting, but things like their spelling mistakes and their word choices and their greetings and their closures would be what make them kind of individual letters. So Thank when you. putting these letters together, like obviously when you finished a collection and I'm such a visual person, so I'm, maybe this is just me, but like I would have painted a picture in my mind of who these people were and what they looked like. Do you do that? So what it's, do brothers look like in your head? Uh, so weirdly, I hear them more than I see them. I think because I work with their thoughts so specifically, it's kind of like when you're reading a book and you get the idea in your head of what a character sounds like, and then you see the film and you're kind of like, oh no, I had him very different now. He was very different in my, that was, so, <laughs> but that's kind of what it is. Um, and I, I'm not a genealogist. Genealogy is where this turns into kind of researching and figuring out family lines. Genealogists are incredible. Um, and that is a full-time job. So the most I've ever done is paid for an ancestry subscription and then gone down the rabbit holes where I think, I think when I did the green letters, I discovered that it's either Rex or Alfred gets married like three times down the line of things one of them is a very stock standard kind of goes home and stays with mama until mama passes away and he lives in the house the whole bit and then the other one is kind of like off being a cowboy so it gets very interesting when you go down into that level but i i don't have the research skills to be a genealogist so unless i can find them with a pretty surface google i don't know what many of them look like <laughs> it's so interesting Okay, what else? We go to the next collection? Sure, good. Oh, these are the Roth letters. So these are the letters I gave you, right? These are the letters you gave me. Well, you gave me a bundle of letters that we thought was one bundle of letters, but is actually two letters, <laughs> two series. Oh, it's two collections. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, even better. <laughs> Tell me so I, I, I get to keep thanking Aoife for the next year when, uh, when I do the next ones. <laughs> All right, so what did you learn in this? Who, who is it, this collection? Is it a husband, wife, brothers? Yep, so um, St. Mark Love Letters is a useful name because a lot of people want it to be amorous love, um, but it is oftentimes familial as well. Um, so in the last example, we had two brothers writing to a mom and in the Roth letters, we do have a husband writing to a wife and vice versa. Uh, there are 21 letters in this series, so it goes from 1938 to 1939, and they're written between a husband named Kay and his wife, Nelda, and I chose these letters not just because their benefactress is, is our host this evening, um, but because, <laughs> but because um, they are a really great example of the letter referencing letters. So on the next slide, um, there's an example of three different letters with different quotes about letters. So the reason these hus this husband and wife are writing to each other and not saying this across the room to each other, they're not in the same house, 
um, is because Nelda was admitted to some sort of mental health treatment facility in the 1930s and 19, the spring, I think, of 1939. So she is in a treatment center, basically. Um, and her husband is two hours away, uh, which in 1939 is a pretty decent car ride. Um, and he comes to visit every Sunday. But in the process of coming to visit every Sunday, they write letters. Um, they try and write letters every day. And I chose these because it really is a great example of the referencing to the act of letter writing in the letters themselves. So uh, I'm a, a contemporary pen paler myself. I was a letter writer. And most letters start with, I'm sorry, this is so late. I've been really busy. Um, and a lot of people think, oh, you know, that's something that we just do now because we're very busy. But no, in the 1930s, they're saying, I didn't have time to get this done a week ago, but I'm doing it now. You better be grateful. And then a ha ha afterwards. And you're kind of like, this is 80 years old. And they're saying like, calm down. I got something in the post. Be happy. <laughs> is there a, do people say, I hope this letter finds you well? Like we say, I hope this email finds you well. <laughs> they, they do. They absolutely do. And then usually they complain about the quality of their pen or pencil. Um, that's probably, oh. that's, yeah, that's probably the most frequent uh, thing that people are usually like, um, you know, sorry if this is hard to read. I'm writing this on military guys, especially in the World War II letters, are usually writing on camp beds. So they're usually like all over the page and trying to apologize for the fact that the lights are about to go out and they've just been in training for 17 hours and it goes around the page. And but yeah, it's, it's like the, like our version of sorry, fat fingers I'm typing on my phone or whatever. <laughs> That's exactly that's exactly what it is. And then it's 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 just, you know, it's funny because you read these things they're 110 years old, they're 80 years old, they're uh, they're just you could read the there would be things we sent yesterday um just on older paper. So do you did you find out what happened to Kay and Nelda? Like do you know like was there any sort of they allude to her leaving the hospital or anything like that? Like what what did you learn about that? So I do know that in her letters up to the end of 39, she talks about getting better. So um, whatever was ailing her, seemed they seemed to be really positive about her progress. Um, the letters end in 39 and I didn't do any kind of additional research after that. But I can tell you uh, that if we go to the next slide, this person sent me a message on Instagram um, that they knew Nelda Roth. <laughs> Which is so oh. interesting because when I met Liz to give her this collection, I actually asked her, I was like, has anyone ever reached out after you've done a collection and said, like, I knew this person? She's like, no, it hasn't happened yet. And then it happened. You manifested it, Aoife. I did. I brought it into being. <laughs> and I got to send her a WhatsApp in the middle of her night and my morning and being like, here you go. Some, someone knew who knows. the wrong way was. to wake up, honestly. Well, it's, 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 so I do flea market because I appreciate the history, but I also do flea market because, you know, on a kind of spiritual level, I think that there's a lot of power in remembering people and remembering ancestors and, and kind of how that all goes down. Um, and so to have somebody who knew Nelda uh, say, you know, not, I can't believe you published her personal letters or, you know, I'm going to call her son and tell him to take, like, the, to have somebody who knew it be like, she was a great lady. I remember that department store. <laughs> just like, Aww. all right. Then. So it's, it's just nice because, you know, Nelda was remembered and will be remembered with everyone here. It's just, it's, it's a way to keep people in your memory and to, and to give them a little bit of a nod. So. And, you, and you gave them a memory that they didn't even, you know, knew that they had. Like that, when they said, hey, I remember that department store, they hadn't thought about that for 50 years, probably. No, no. So you, and, you helped uh, create, you know, recreate that. And for them, that's cool. Yeah, it's, it's a, one of my favorite things to actually do. That's a great point, Donald. One of my favorite things to do is to go back to uh, where I have letters from. So uh, because York, Pennsylvania is actually close to kind of, the, my parents are from Pennsylvania. Uh, when travel opens back up again, you can be sure there will be a blog post of me mucking around york with a big envelope all excited in front of <laughs> oh i love doing it i went to a house i went to a house in pennsylvania with letters from 19 i want to say 17 or 18 and i stood on the same porch that the letter was sent from 101 years before wow wow yeah yeah that's so yeah. cool it's fun 
thanks guys for humoring my mail. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> it's great though it's like a good example of how like you're bringing these lives and these stories to life yeah thank you Virginia. thank you it's it's really important I think as well to think about the fact that like everybody has a story like this everybody has a grandmother's letter or a found letter or they were at a thrift shop and they bought a book and there was a letter in the book and um like letters are not rare things uh, they're becoming rarer because they aren't being, you know, preserved and they're being thrown away more in the digital age, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I think everybody has a letter story. So letter things like this inspire people because they think, you know, oh, I should dig out the postcards from that I found at that flea market or whatever it is. And it's a whole it's a whole real story, you know, in, in four by six cards. So what's the next collection, Liz? The next ones uh, are our last letters for the evening. These are the Ahern letters. Um, they are written by a man named Bill Ahern to his family while he is stationed abroad for World War II. So unlike the Green Brothers seeing a little bit of service, the Ahern, Billy Ahern saw a lot of service to the point where, um, I'll talk about this and then when we get to the next slide, I'll explain why I'm so sure that he saw a lot of things. Uh, this is a great example, this little image that I have pulled here of kind of how you could have a letter collection of 40 letters and it could be just as interesting for him to write his laundry list as it is for the fact that this is victory over Japan day, which is the day that Japan surrendered in World War II. Um, and it's just like, he's just scribbled it at the top of the page. And when I started doing flea market sort of more seriously than I was in the beginning, I am, um, the dates are harder for me to stick. So like you could say August 15th to me and I would be like, okay. But when I read it in a context like this, you get goosebumps. Like when you see yeah. and you know what these little moments of history are like. So um, he's writing his letters to his parents back in New Jersey and he is stationed abroad for years. I don't think he ends up going home until maybe the end of 45. I don't think he's home until 46. Because I think around, if I remember correctly, around Christmas to 45, he's talking about how long it's taking to get home. Um, so if we go to the next slide, thank you, Eva. Um, when I was putting this together, um, I don't like to throw up entire letters on the screen because they can be a lot to kind of deal with, a lot of reading. Uh, so this is an example of a letter from Billy Ahern, May 7th, 1945, where he uh, is talking about what he can't wait to tell people when he gets home now that the war is over because the letters aren't being censored anymore. So this is how I know that he did a lot of service because um, he's talking about kind of all the things he's seen. Uh, he met the Pope, which he never told anyone about because the censors wouldn't have wanted him to tell people that where he was in Italy. So uh, we have no idea when he met the Pope, but he met the Pope. Um, he went on Mussolini's balcony, <laughs> which like- <laughs> Oh my God. Uh, Oh yeah, he went to Pompeii, he, Churchill passed him in a parade. Um, and it's just like, these are the things that, you know, he didn't include in letters because the censors would have cut them out. And at the beginning of this letter, he started just saying, you know, I can't wait to get home and tell you what really happened, which is unusual because a oh, lot it's of- Oh, it's so juicy. You're like, no, write it down so I can read it a hundred years later. <laughs> leave, leave more for me to read a hundred years later. I want to be yes. more interested in this. <laughs> wow that's amazing so do you don't see him out get home he's still in Italy so by the time that collection ends yeah so I was trying to kind of piece these together uh this afternoon to really kind of refresh myself with them and I had remembered he mentions Nuremberg um he mentions being in Nuremberg uh the timeline doesn't match up perfectly um, so he could have been in Nuremberg before the trials. He could have been there with the forces like setting it up um, or clearing it out. Like there's a whole, <laughs> he's a little bit vague about some of that stuff, but I do remember him mentioning Nuremberg because I started reading these about two or three years ago. They were one of the first letters that we shared. And um, I remember thinking Nuremberg is an important word. Uh, and I went back to find it today and he, he does talk about being there and kind of, you know, policing things. He's he's one of the more transparent writers. A lot of the guys who are writing home are very much based on kind of fantasy land of not wanting to live where they are. Um, but he is a very good example of someone who's writing as much as he can about 
the war while he's in it, um, which is why I would trust Bill's letters more to kind of be, yes, I am in Nuremberg. Yes, I stood on Mussolini's back balcony, et cetera. Wow, so interesting. So you're really getting a feel for their personality and not that the others aren't being honest to your point, it's that they're just like, I don't wanna share harrowing stuff right now. I just wanna like turn off a little bit and think of home. Fundamentally, yeah. No, and it's, it's, there's actually like letter writing guides and things from the 1940s from civilians writing to men in the service because there were women in the service, but it was fundamentally men that they were writing to. Um, but a lot of the guides sort of suggest letter prompts and the letter prompts are absolutely farcical. They're like, you know, tell them about the dance you went to. And when you're thinking about as well, like particularly what was happening during the blitz, a lot of the letters would be, you know, if you were talking honestly, you would be like, it is terrifying, but you're writing someone on the front. So you're sort of being like, well, I, I got new stockings. Um, and that's, that's about uh, the nicest thing to happen in 1945. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so yeah, so it's, it's, and you know, I make a lot of dark jokes about it, dark humor about it, because I have to. Um, yeah. it's, it's a lot of intense stuff to deal with, uh, but it's also really harrowing to see kind of the endurance of the human spirit. Yeah, that's true. Liz, do you, um, just speaking about the war and the blitz, do you, have you mainly gotten these letters from collections at flea markets in the US or have you managed to like wrangle any out of Ireland or England? That's a great question. Um, and one that I was kind of thinking about how I would fold in earlier because I have found maybe five Irish letters since living here. Um, I would go ahead and say that the Irish are a much bigger fan of uh, fireplaces. <laughs> I was gonna say people probably didn't oh. mind them as much. Yeah, yeah, and I have I have my own family story of family letters kind of you know meeting the ashes in a different way. <laughs> right, we like to go back to the soil, you know. Yeah, it's all. I very never would have thought of that. They were burning them. Oh yeah. Yeah. I would say, I would say there's, there's significant, there's more in England. I've been to England and I found more kind of postcards and letters there than I have here. I found a few here, but the ones here are mostly like, I found one the other day from, I think the 1900s. And it was basically just a mom excusing the kid from school because their cousin had been uptown. <laughs> and she was like, the cousin was leaving in the afternoon. So we held him back. And I was like, well, that's very Thoughtful. Where 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 did you find that one, Liz? Are you are, are there flea markets as as big a phenomenon over there as um, in the states, or where did you come across that one, or how? There's uh, there's no flea markets here. There's car boot sales, which are basically where everybody drives to a parking lot and opens their trunk um, and sells tea towels. It's it's a wild time. Um, but there would I I miss and crave a good old fashioned dusty American flea market with a guy chain smoking from his van telling you, yeah, I think I got some letters uh, in here somewhere. You come back in an hour. And then he comes, you come back and there's just a box of envelopes. Uh, I do a lot. Of I don't know. I, do. I don't think I could do ten dollars that I mean, I, maybe maybe oh, yeah. I could do ten. <laughs> Alice, you're not looking in the right place. There's plenty of shady characters selling stuff from their <laughs> car in Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't found my niche yet, but no, no, it's a great question. Um, I have a number of Irish Irish letters that are, you know, probably under 10 out of the whole collection. I probably have about 10 Irish letters. Wow. All right. So what is there more letters in the collection, Liz? Are we going to we're going to talk about the Write More Letters project, right? We are. Yeah. So that was our little blip through history. We went through World War One. We jumped to the 1930s. We were hanging out in the 1940s. And now we're going to talk about 2020, which is when um, I started the Write More Letters Project. The Write More Letters Project is a fundraiser for the U.S. charity Hope for the Warriors, which benefits uh, U.S. veterans and military families in wish fulfillment and civilian life adjustment. So basically they help with job prep, uh, kind of anything that when you're coming out of the service, um, and you need help. Uh, Hope for the Warriors has a grant program or an advisor there. Most of the people who work at Hope for the Warriors are either veterans or um, military family members themselves. So it's a really tight knit group of people who understand the veteran experience. And I started the Write More Letters Project during September 2020 because 
basically I knew I wanted to do something for charity with the fund with flea market. I don't make any money off of flea market. I never have. Um, I pay for everything out of pocket or by donation and it's all donated time. So anything that I've ever raised through the Write More Letters project goes to Hope for the Warriors through the sale of these masks, the mugs, the totes, the teas, all sorts of stuff you see there. Um, I make donations to the wonderful guys over there and they do awesome work with it. So I like to advocate for more letter writing in this century um, and do what I can to support our veterans. That is lovely and very timely, Liz, because next week is Veterans Day on the 11th. So yes. I'm going to put in the chat, if anyone wants to donate through the Flea Market Love Letters link for the Write More Letters project, you can. And also, it is Liz's birthday on that day. So every <laughs> Birthday. Happy birthday, Liz. How do we donate to that cause? <laughs> well, no, it's... Uh, Can it's... we call your local and put a bit of money behind the bar for you? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to ruin this nice moment. Carry on. No, 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 no. Um, that's a very that's natural an, suggestion. That's an improvement, yeah. That's, that's <laughs> good that's, I hadn't thought of that. No, forget about fundraising. I gotta start me raising. <laughs> Um, so this Tell us about this quote, Liz. This is, I wanted to throw this up here because the reason that I chose Hope for the Warriors, I was on a podcast last year talking about uh, flea market love letters and uh, a woman named Emily got in touch with me on the Instagram and she sent me, this is a clip from the message, but basically she sent me a message about how her husband was active in the military and how they stayed in touch with letters even a decade ago, five years ago. Um, and I kind of hadn't made the connection of the fact that Flea Market was a veterans project because there are letter series that aren't affiliated with veterans. It isn't fundamentally a World War II, World War I project. Um, but then when I sort of <laughs> pulled back and I thought, yeah, no, this is, this is the spot that you're missing. Um, so I always credit Emily because she, you know, sent me one message and it started the path down connecting with Hope for Warriors. And I just think it's really important to, like I said, at the top of the call to remember, um, people's memories by keeping their names and their stories alive, but also by doing that by people who are still with us. So that's why I support Hope for the Warriors. Oh, that's lovely, Liz. Such a great idea. And well done, Emily, for that, that one comment started something, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to open it up for questions now, everyone. Oh, sorry, I have one more before you do that. Oh, okay. um, well, people are warming up with their questions. Liz or Roshi, go ahead with yours. People How do you want people to ask questions? Come off mute or put them in the box? Whichever they're comfortable with. I think this is a pretty relaxed group. So whatever people are feeling. Okay, so guys, get, get warmed up. Get your vocal cords going. Um, <laughs> Liz, uh, I'm sorry, this is just in reference to the last point about Emily. Um, did you, was there a point when you started noticing like, oh, people are reading this, like this is catching on, I am reaching an audience and kind of what, um, how did you do that? Like, how did you go from just doing this as a hobby that you liked to chronicle and archive these letters to, oh, people are, are reading this? Um, so I have a degree in marketing. It's actually why I left DC. I came to Dublin to do my master's in marketing. And I went to a very esteemed university, which was very strong on theory and not a lot on practical. So I spent a lot of my lectures being told how to make an Instagram account. And I was like, why don't, why aren't we doing this? And people were like taking notes, log in make an Instagram account. And I was like, I just made one. What do I do? Like, <laughs> so I used, I used a lot of stuff from the marketing course uh, to kind of figure out a business model basically for flea market um, because I needed to, I needed to get it into people's spaces. I needed people to see it because I knew I wanted to build it into something that would be charitable ultimately. Um, so I built up the flea market Instagram. We didn't have our own website until 2019. Uh, I set myself a goal of a month to build a Wix uh, and it was a, you know, every page was white. It had a picture of a letter stuck on it and the text was in the bottom of the thing, but I had that website and I was putting it everywhere. Um, so I was trying to build a presence there. And then in 
2019, 2020, I realized um, podcasts were a really great place to go to talk. So I started pitching Flea Market to any podcast that would listen. Uh, I have been on podcasts with like some 2.4 million listens uh, to ones that are a, a religious writer who does them over the phone in the basement of her house. <laughs> So like I have, I have talked to someone who has two listeners to millions of listeners. Um, I have been on the news and I've seen nothing come from it, but I have talked on a 40 person podcast and seen 38 people follow the page and send me emails about letters. Um, so kind of to the point of how do you grow anything or something like this? Um, the best thing you can do is throw yourself at it with just the strategy of having something to send people to. And when they get there, have it be something that they're going to be interested in. Because I think the worst thing you can do is get somebody interested and then send them somewhere that's a dead end. So um, that's, that's kind of how I got some market going is I, I knew the site was where it needed to be. And then it actually ended up being that in the spring of this year, um, I worked with a web developer out of Australia who had never done anything with Wix. So we got in touch and they uh, actually donated the work on the website. So they redid the website for me in February of this year um, because they wanted to practice with Wix and I was willing to let them mess around with my baby. And, and two months later, I had a brand new website and uh, it's, it's all just about helping each other out and getting a presence. Awesome. Thanks. That's, That's really um, inspirational. Wix, uh, somebody asked, is the website platform like it's a, a self-service kind of website builder that you can use. Um, yeah, it, it's just well done. Like you clearly have a great reach. And, you know, that quote from Emily and the community um, comments that we talked about earlier in the call, I think are testament to that reach. So well oh, done. And as a new organization Irish Network Portland is taking inspiration from you <laughs> well please please you know if they if you stick a stick a postcard up on Instagram you'd be amazed what people uh people people love mail they just love mail it's I think because they get these idea that they remember when they got a birthday card or they got a letter in the mail and then they just love mail there is some mail I don't love <laughs> no bills I don't love bills but a letter that you know is coming like and you know the handwriting I actually have the USPS scan so I, every morning I get the scan of everything that's going to be coming into my mailbox in my email and whenever there's like obviously a birthday card or something I'm like I can't wait come on just <laughs> I have to wait hours for it the anticipation of who is it from because most Irish people don't actually write the address in the top corner like Americans do so you don't know who it's coming from sometimes in Ireland from Ireland Donald, do you have a question? Oh, yeah. I do. Um, Liz, those of us who love following your success and your growth on this project, uh, we're really excited to see some of the media hits that you were getting. I think it was this calendar year, if I'm recalling correctly, in, over in Ireland and, and some England. Um, and so you just referenced it and added the phrase, so nothing really came of it, but, which prompts my question, which is, what would be a good outcome? I mean, obviously, maybe donations to the Write More Letters campaign would be one example. Is there anything else? Like, what would be an upside? I mean, A, getting it out there and telling a story is its own reward. So I, so I wouldn't even have had that thought that you're savvy in your marketing thinking. And so when you say nothing came out of it, what might have, what could have, what might in the future, what would you like? Yeah, uh, so... Great question. Um, and I love thinking about flea market in the future because every year I kind of say, you know, oh, that was a great year. Next year, next year can't top that. And then I'm on Sky News and I'm like, okay, that's next year did top that. Okay. And then next year, um, I did an interview with someone in the spring of this year that they kind of ghosted me afterwards. And I was like, oh, I sent them a follow up email. I said, can I get you anything? And then she went, yeah, the book will be published and you're in it in April. And I was like, okay, so I guess that's coming in 2021. So like when I say nothing really came of it in, in that context, uh, you're on this national screen and you're saying your Instagram handle, no, no I saw no interest, I saw no visitors, I saw no, nothing um, because they weren't people who were interested in that. They were people who were in hotel rooms getting ready for work conferences going, she, she really talks about mail a lot. And then, you know, changing the channel over. 
Whereas it's a podcast that I've done about books. Uh, the topic was books about letters. And I, that's where Emily found me. Um, and she sent me messages, you know, a lot of people sent messages about found letters and letters they had and, and different history in the attic, if you will. Um, because that was, you know, people who were interested in the project. You can, you can throw your line at everybody or your net at everybody, but you're not going to catch anybody unless, you know, you have what they're looking for. That's what I'm saying about when you're building something to have an interest for them to land on, because you can have as nice of a website as you want, but if there's nothing there, there's no point. As you said earlier that you're a modern letter writer, how do you, who do you write to? What do you write about? Do you write to strangers? I got new stockings today <laughs> in 1945. In 19, it was basically that I way. I thought you said Donald Socks when you said that. I was like, oh, so you're writing letters to Donald Socks. Oh, cool. <laughs> no, no. Uh, so there was a project that started in the spring of 2020 by a writer from the New Yorker called Penpalooza. And um, it was... It's still going, but it was very popular during lockdown um, because it was a software you, that you secret Santa software to match people to exchange letters. So um, I started exchanging letters that way. And then I'm on Twitter probably more than I need to be. And I just started saying, you know, everybody's having a tough couple of weeks. If you want a postcard, send me your address. And then that evolved into this January of this year. Um, I said, you know, Nobody should have a lockdown birthday without a birthday card. Send me your address if you want a birthday card. So I've sent over 125 birthday cards to strangers. <laughs> oh my God, Liz, that's lovely. It's, it's lovely. It's also very expensive. So it will be a calendar year project. Because so how many years. countries did you send letters to? So I've sent like personal letters uh, to Australia, the States, uh, England, France, Prague, um, and then birthday cards and things like that. I've sent, I think I sent one to Asia, but I don't know if it ever got there um, just because of kind of it being a, just a postcard. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> That's so amazing. I can't believe you did that. It's so nice. Oh, stop. You would do it too if you were sitting at home alone during lockdown and being like, ah, oh, just send a birthday card. It'd be fine. See, I okay. did. I did create a card during lockdown uh, of my dog, which you can see. And we it, just found that today. <laughs> when the world gets it together, can't wait to see you. And I did hold it close. It. Hold it close to the camera. Oh, that's so cool. Love it. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, I'm gonna lower the tone here. Have you ever like come across really sorted or weird stuff in the letters? <laughs> my favorite question <laughs> um yes uh and I will tell this as politically correctly as possible I said at the top of the call or in the middle of the call uh I don't always have to be best friends with the people whose letters I'm transcribing um sometimes the Randano letters particularly I could only do two or three at a time and then I had to like take a break because they were the definition of 1940s bros so there was just a lot of a lot of bro talk that when you're a 2021 feminist you're kind of like oh <laughs> ooh, that's very that's very not good um so in those letters particularly once I was transcribing them and uh I had one open and I was typing it out and I folded the page back and there was an illustration uh mm. that young men still do today um in the corner and uh 1944 just hanging out there in the corner of the letter bro to bro and I was just like, it's amazing how, you know, times never change. <laughs> how mature people continue change. to be. Mm -hmm. Got it. So Samantha asked, did, do you ever get photos with the letters? So Samantha, that is a great question. Um, and I don't know if you're a plant, but uh, it's one of my favorite questions because one of the most tra kind of transformative series from the project has been the love letter triangle series that I did with Betty, Jack, and Henry. Um, and that was World War II. That was uh, two fellas and a lady. And it ends up that um, she breaks up with one of the guys to get date the other. And then he ends up dying. And then she ends up marrying the first one. And I didn't know any of this. 
So I inherited these letters. I was gifted five of them uh, to read and see if I liked them. And these were the letters that I knew had something to do with him dying. And I felt that I couldn't only have five of them knowing that there were more out there. I couldn't break up the collection. So I remember when I got the collection, I was kind of like really intense. I didn't really want them because I knew they were very intense. Um, and through doing them and kind of trying to honor their story and the fact that, you know, I know at least one of them died. Um, I did find that was the first time I ever found a photo with the letters. Um, and I found a photo of Jack in his last letter that I had from the collection. I don't know if it's the last letter that he ever sent, but it's the last letter that I have from him to her. And he's cut it into the letter, like a little frame. Um, and it's just like a little passport photo. Um, but it is the first time I've ever found a letter with the photos. Um, and that yeah. series particularly was uh, a bit intense. <laughs> Liz, you once told me that you've never opened letters that were never opened by the receiver why tell people why people love this because like i find think, this fascinating because people think when my like cocktail story is that i read other people's mail and people are like oh that's, that's, that's a frankly, federal that's illegal. crime <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. that's illegal um but i will not open a letter from 1912 from 19 five from 1950 I will not open a letter that has not been opened before me so I have why I have, tell people why it's just bad juju <laughs> I just I as I told you I tell the letters every day I say good morning I I'm like you know please don't haunt me but if if the letter <laughs> hasn't been opened before I I don't I don't go near it I just I say all right put it back in there and you, yeah, I don't know where the letters will go after me. I would love them to go to a museum. I would love them to go somewhere that isn't just, you know, my home office, but I, I won't open a letter that hasn't been opened. Talk about what killers are, Liz. <laughs> I trapped Aoife in Stephen's Green uh, with talk about this. So I should have had it now because it'll be messed up with this. But when you get a letter and there's um, black lines over the stamp, that's called a killer. So the postmark is the circle that has the post office depot of where it was sent and when. Um, and the black lines that go over a stamp are called killers. So uh, when Eva was giving me the letters that uh, are now the Rock series, I was showing her that in different times of US history, they've used different types of killers. So we can actually, actually see killers in the slideshow that's still exactly. being presented. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So they've in different times of history used those for different sort of marketing or morale purposes um particularly during the depression they used them for um you know save paper or save savings bonds for world war ii they did a lot for war bonds go victory that sort of stuff um so the killers in the post the envelopes themselves tell a whole separate story really to the letters inside so, um, you know, if I'm going through a collection and they're like in the collection I'm doing right now, there are a number of empty envelopes. Those can still tell you a lot about what's going on because you have the context on either side. You have kind of the letters from before and the letters after, so you can follow where the postmark is from and, and that sort of stuff. And the stamps, the stamps as well. Liz, did you know that I used to be a mail delivery person in Ireland? Because you said the Um, And you could tell a lot from the envelope. I learned a lot about people's lives during those times. <laughs> she, did, did you ever see the upside down stamps? I don't remember upside down stamps. What does that mean? It's an old Victorian code for um, I love you. So it's a uh, oh. special type of, uh, it's actually still used uh, by military members today. But upside down, if, if anyone ever comes across an upside down stamp, it's either an I love you or a hastily applied stamp. There's always a 50-50 chance it was just <laughs> Yeah, the letters that Applied were being jar. delivered in Mount Rath County Leash didn't have many I love you's in them, obviously. Didn't have many. <laughs> okay, well, well thank, thank you for your to, service, Roshi. <laughs> we're coming up to closing time. So I wanna make sure that everyone who wants to ask a question can ask a question you do please unmute uh, now and feel free to ask your question. While people are unmuting, 
Liz, I have a surprise for you. I have four more collections for you. Who knows this? And I want to tell you, I have a whole package of more Roth letters for you. Are you messing really Roth? Oh, Seriously? Christmas in November. Thank you, INBC. I literally have more bundles for you. This is no truly a labor of love we can see. You're not kidding. Nelda, Nelda had this brother, I think a brother, who was involved in the Chicago ballet world. And I'm hoping, oh, now I'm excited. Because uh, there, was no. only, there was only one from there. And, and he was just, if you think Great Gatsby, that was this brother. Oh, wow. I'm so, I'm so excited. Okay, well, I'll, I'll privately scream. They're very well yeah. deserved. <laughs> and we really... Thank you for doing this event uh, and sharing your passion and hobby with us. We're, it's so interesting and we love getting through the letters. Uh, yeah, echo that thanks from Irish Network Portland and thank you to Irish Network DC for inviting us to be part of this. Been great. Maybe we can do a part two. Yeah, when she gets those letters. Yeah, let's do it. Maybe this can be a series. Guys. <laughs> All right, we're gonna slide over to the next slide just to talk about uh, a little bit about where you can find Liz online. And then we're gonna talk about upcoming events uh, for INDC and IOM Portland. Liz, what do you want people to know about where they can find you? So uh, if you're on Instagram, we are at Flea Market Love Letters with an S on the end. Our logo is a little envelope. If you are, would prefer to be on our newsletter or would like to be on our newsletter as well, we send it every third Thursday. I don't know anywhere else that ever does anything every third Thursday, hashtag INDC. <laughs> 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 when I was setting up the newsletter, I was like, I need a regular day. Every third Thursday, that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> so we send our newsletter every third Thursday um, and it is full of found letter news and letter stories. And as always, um, I know some of you who are on the call, and I don't know some of you who are here, but if you have a letter story, I cannot emphasize enough that I would love to hear it. So if you want to send me an email or send me a message on Instagram, want to send me some photos or tell me about your letters, I'm here. Lovely. Thank you, Liz. All right. I'm going to head on over. I'm actually going to make Donald unmute, and I'm going to get him to talk a little bit about our upcoming event for INDC. Great idea and uh, great timeliness. Let's see, it's not going to be the third Thursday, so that's a shame. I, I love you re-reminding us INDCers that our socials are often on the third Thursdays list, so that's fun. Thank you. Um, but this coming Thursday, the 2nd of November, meaning the 11th of November, the 2nd Thursday, we, INDC is going to be joining with Solas Nua, the uh, Organization for New Irish Arts here based in uh, Where'd he go? Donald is gone. Well, while he gets back to us, I am actually going to put the link to the uh, event that he's talking about in the chat. Behold. Um, INDC is partnering with Solis Nua um, for a showing of the new movie Belfast by Kenneth Branagh. So, and um, you should all be able to buy tickets at this link here. We'd love to have you. All right, Roshin, you want to talk a little bit about the upcoming? Oh no, he's 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 going, but he's muted. He hasn't realized he's oh, muted. Oh, thanks. That's right. Thank oh, you, Eva, okay. for Hello. thanks for confirming. Yep, uh, details are certainly on our website as well as Solas as well as Solas Nua's website for joining us at Belfast this Thursday. Thanks, Eva, for picking up when I knocked off. No problem. Links in the chat, everyone. I wish I could join ENDC for that, but um, actually Irish Network Portland were uh, gifted a small number of tickets to an advanced screening that is on November 9th. So um, a contingent from Irish Network Portland will also be having a special preview of, awesome. um, of the Belfast movie. We're very excited about that. And then also this week on Wednesday morning, the 10th, um, 
At 7.15 a.m., so set your alarm clocks, we have a business breakfast, which will be virtual, will be on Zoom, will be joined by um, a growing Irish business growth pit stop, and they're going to talk us through their um, their business model, uh, they work in motivation, so we'll learn a lot about being motivated and productive and um, we're looking forward to that event and learning a lot and getting to know Growth Pit Stop and then um, from something productive to maybe something less productive on December 3rd, we're having our holiday party. It will be our inaugural holiday party. We're going to have it at Kells Pub um, on Friday, December 3rd. So Very there- Best um, of luck with those events, Roisin, that sounds great. Yeah, we're looking forward to them both. Um, already an invite has gone out for the business breakfast and we have um, a Zoom link for that. Uh, there will be a more formal invite to the holiday party coming. All right, fabulous. Well, we're leaving ourselves three minutes to spare. Thank you everyone for joining us today. This is a really fun conversation. Liz, thank you so much for doing this. Yes, I, thank you. Thank you both. You have no idea. I was I was worried I wouldn't be able to stay up, but now I'm deaf. I could go. I could run the block with the news <laughs> that there's more letters coming. I'm like, Good. I'm so <laughs> happy. <laughs> Poor Sam is going to get no sleep tonight out of the excitement <laughs> of these letters. All right. Thank you so much to everyone for joining us. Thank you, Roisin, to I am Portland for joining us. This has been great. Maybe we'll do another one soon. Everyone. Yeah, see. looking forward to the next one. Thank you, yes. everybody, for joining. Take care. Bye -bye. Thanks, Bye. Lizzie. Thanks, Rasheen. Thanks, Ifa. Bye. Bye. <laughs>